So our scripture this morning comes from the prophet Isaiah, and uh, Pastor Heather broke it down for the kids in such a wonderful way, so I'll try to come behind my friend and do the best I can for you all this morning. The 43rd chapter, just one verse, I'll preach long enough, we don't need the scripture to be long. <laughs> And that is the 19th verse of this book and what is what I consider one of the, one of the greatest books of the Bible, the uh, prophet Isaiah, of the book of Isaiah named after the prophet. And this one particular verse just says this, Behold or see, I am doing a new thing. Somebody say new thing. All right, y'all talking back to me like this is East Liberty Baptist Church. I love it. <laughs> now it springs up, or springs forth. Do you not perceive it? Do you not behold it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. One more time for your hearing. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. So friends, on this wonderful, brisk Sunday morning, let's share for a couple of moments on the topic of becoming. Becoming. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, no one came here to hear from Shania. We came to hear from you. So God, have your way. We are all waiting to hear what spirit has for us in this place that we're in right now. Give us a word that will prick us, that will comfort us, that will teach us, that will grow us, that will love on us to our best selves. Help us, God, because without you, we can't do it. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Becoming. So despite my stuffy nose and my deeper than normal octave of voice and my inability to breathe over the last couple of days, I really, 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 really love this season <laughs> that we're in. I really do. And it's not just because my birthday is in less than 15 days at this point. Praise the Lord. Amen. 1010, just in case <laughs> you're wondering. 1010. I love it because this time of year is one of the two times of year where you can really see the change of seasons and how evident it is to all of our senses. And it's imperatively clear that one thing is becoming another. Can't be denied. It's literally everywhere. It's the air that is more brisk and more crisp. We have shifted our casual, laissez-faire attitudes of fun in the sun summertime to a more robust back to school and back to business state of mind. Our eyes are often captivated by the progressing foliage that moves from the monotone of vibrant green to a plethora of colors and hues that pepper the landscape of our lives. The Trees are changing. It's everywhere. There's something happening in this season. Our clothing changes to accommodate the temperature slowly but steadily dropping as we march more and more toward winter. In fact, I think it was yesterday or the day before that marked the beginning of fall season. And even our taste buds switch up on us as they rise to consumer com uh, commerce that centers on pumpkin spice, <laughs> apple cider, and the horrible, obviously, gift from the devil, candy corn. <laughs> it's terrible, y'all. It's terrible. We can argue about it later. I'm just saying it's terrible, especially to somebody that has braces. It's terrible. Anyway. But yes, fall or autumn 
Much like spring is a definitive shifting in the natural realm of the earth in every way. The seasons of time are moving and we can behold what once was is becoming something brand new. However, what many of us miss is not only is there a change happening in nature, but there is a shift happening spiritually in particular in this season as well. And if you and I aren't careful, we will miss what God is transforming in our lives. Walk with me, won't you? I think the prophet Isaiah understands what I'm talking about in this 43rd chapter of the book bearing his name. Here we encounter the major prophet as he seeks to uplift, to admonish, to encourage, and prophesy to the people of Israel. We know Israel, don't we? They done been through some things, amen? They done seen some things, amen? They done walked some walks and had some journeys. We know Israel, don't we? And Isaiah is speaking to them, the people of Israel, while they are at the point of Babylonian captivity. They're in a place of unknowing, a place of restlessness, a wilderness of sorts. They're in a place where God has taken them to now in this place of undetermined and unfamiliar. They have gone from the good days to the bewildering days. They are displaced and despondent and in need of God's guidance and direction. And understandably, that Isaiah feels called to speak to them in a way that reminds them of their connection to the divine. They are in a place of unknowing, but Isaiah seeks to tell them that, hold on now, remember who you are. You are still God's people. You are still in God's will, and you are still a part of God's covenant. He comes to remind them that their connection to the divine is the reminder that even though change is coming, trouble does not last always. It is in his theology that Isaiah upheld the same framework as such prophets as Amos that went before him in this long-standing tradition that there is a special bond between, that unites Israel and God's people. The same bond exists for us even today. It is this connection to God that he's encouraging Israel to not forget. Is that when we are connected to a God who is not far off in times of trouble, trial, and transition, Isaiah is clear to remind them that they serve a God who is very present in times of troubles like these. And although this concept is very common to us now, at least I hope it's common to us now, I hope you know that whatever you're going through, that God is with you. I hope you know that God has not left you in whatever situation, season, and transition you find yourself in. So it's common to us now, but this was not always the case in antiquity. You still with me? I still need to talk back, all right? I'm still kind of at my introduction. I promise you I won't be long. <laughs> it's Isaiah's understanding of Israel's God did not fit into the picture of other things going on in 8th century Israel. And the rest of 8th century Israel, the rest of that time and antiquity was very much uh, an idea that God is a God of rampant misery and injustice, that God is a vengeful God, that God does not care, that God only wants gloom and doom. This is the picture that others have had in this season. Time of menace and upheaval and making one holler the way they do in my life is just, just not the best of earth. But Isaiah stands out in this particular pericope of scripture as one who sees promise where others see peril. Instead, for Isaiah, God was not a tyrant, but a benevolent and merciful lover of creation who cared about the lives of people. To the God of Isaiah, people matter more than offerings and showy forms of worship. To the God of Israel and the God in Isaiah's eyes, God cares about all people. God cares about every situation in your life. God cares about all that you're going through. God is not a far off. Yo, wherever, yay, wherever I am, God is with me. If I make my bed in hell, 
God is with me. If I am destitute, God is with me. If I am in abundance, God is with me. If I am in lack, God is with me. The covenant between God and humanity, humanity established long ago dictated that God has chosen them and cares for them. Do you know God cares for you? Do you know God loves you? Do you know that you are you, 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 you are the apple of God's eye? That you are beloved? That you are carefully and wonderfully made and crafted to be the wonderfulness that you are with your bad self. <laughs> Sitting here in East Liberty, look at you. You look good. Because God did that. Amen. That's who you are. And that's who God, that's who Isaiah is reminding Israel that they are. So God, that's what Isaiah is saying here in this 43rd chapter. It's not that God is afar off and unconcerned about where they are figuratively and literally in life. Instead, God is very much concerned with where aware, and aware of where they are and also where they cannot stay. Because God has a plan for where they're destined to go. God has a plan for you. But you're just not out here by yourself. You're not just out here trying to figure this out by yourself. God has a plan for you. And I don't care if you are 2, 12, 22, 102. God has a plan for your life. So bad. And so this place that Israel is in, they have forgotten this connection to God because all they see is captivity. All they see is the wilderness. All they see is the mess of life that is all around them. And I get that, I understand. Some of us, that's where we get stuck too, right? Because life keeps lifing. And stuff keeps happening, and the mess and the cares and the woes of concerns often weigh us down and break our backs, and it's hard to see that there could ever be a plan for you. Some of us are at this crossroads right now. The pandemic and the last few years have put us in a very peculiar season. It's been a season of great loss season of unearthing, and for some of us, a season of not knowing and loss of direction. Some of us have felt like, God, are you still even with us? And is there anything even called God out there? Some have felt stagnant and stuck, like I can't move. Some have felt frustrated and forgotten. And I will tell you, I will remind you on today that you were not forgotten. Never have been, never will be. I and mean, maybe for some of us in here today, we have felt like this season you have been in your life that God has abandoned you. And you are just out here trying to figure it out on your own. Well, people of God, friends, cousins, family, I've come to you this morning for the second time. In the same spirit of the prophet Isaiah to proclaim to you that you are not alone and you darn sure ain't forgotten. Amen. What you have been experiencing is a shift that is happening in the spirit room. And that is awkward season of change to what we are becoming. Because becoming an evolution is upon us. Still walking with me? I, don't, I heard like three people. That's good enough. Amen. That's good enough. Maybe y'all sleeping in ships. That's fine. <laughs> good. All right. I got it. But we are becoming something in this season. There's a shift, not just in nature, not just in the trees, not just in what is featured at Starbucks. There's a shift happening. We are becoming. When God is calling you into becoming, God may be doing something new, and you have to be in tune with the Spirit to know what God is about to do and how God is showing up. The people of Israel are in a period of shift, but what they are focused on 
is the wilderness and not the possibility of what is even in front of their eyes. But I understand this. I got sympathy for them. I really do. Because not only have I been there, and if we were honest, several of us have been there. Amen. So I get it. Because we all go through seasons differently. Shift is necessary to become. Change is necessary. Evolution is necessary. Movement is necessary. You understand that we are all shape shifters? We have all become something that we didn't used to be? If so, we would all still be crawling on the ground and not able to speak and poop in our pants. <laughs> now, if that's your story right now, that's fine, no judgment. But the, for the majority of us, we have shape-shifted and morphed even now. We are all the products of not only who we used to be, but who we're yet becoming. Yeah. Every situation in our lives has shifted and changed. So we have shape-shifted because of what we've been through. Your story is not my story. What you've been through is not what I've been through. That's why we are different. And that's why we are shaped and formed the way our lives have shaped and formed us according to God's will for us. The question is, how are you going to go through what you're going through? How are you? What is your posture? What is your attitude? What is your mindset as you are yet becoming? I think there's at least three. I could be wrong. I rarely am. <laughs> Ask my friends, they're here. But I think there's at least three. The first person, or the first type, is the one who is becoming in a begrudging, stifling, self-sabotaging, resentful, and reluctant way. If that's you, don't say amen. Just going through kicking and screaming. Becoming but don't really want to become, at least not like this. And I get that. I get that too. Letting go in order to embrace can be a scary thing. And there's a lot of that in our lives every day. Being able to shift and to morph into what God is calling us to requires a shift and a change in our behavior. We can't do things like we used to do. It's a shift in our attitudes, in our mindsets. How we used to think in the last season is not going to work in the next season. I think the Bible says something about when I was a child, I acted like a child, like a child I thought like a child, I did childish things, but when I became grown, I put away childish things. There's a shift that has to happen. And then also, not only they require a shift in our behaviors, our attitudes, our mindsets, but sometimes people in our lives got a shift. They no longer serve the purpose for your next season. Amen? Amen? I know what that's like, to lose connection with some people, not because they were bad people, because life shifts and morphs and changes. You with me? Sometimes your vision Connections and way of being has to change as God shifts you because you will never be able to operate fully in where you're going holding on to what you used to do. You can't go this way holding back to this. It just doesn't work that way. So some of us do that for grudging. Attitude. Sometimes we hold on longer than we should because of fear and not knowing. And some of us need to ask ourselves, what is holding us back from fully becoming free to become and behold the new that God is calling us to? What is keeping you from trusting that there is yet a plan unfolding for your life? What is keeping you from not seeing what God is doing? Or better yet, who is keeping you? For what God is doing. And ask yourself this. Is it you? 
Sometimes we can be our own worst enemy and our biggest stumbling block. Ask me how I know. It's now been turned into a group meeting. I realized a long time ago that as I evolve, my friendships, connections, mindsets, and attitudes have to evolve too, or we've got to go our separate ways. Something has got to fade away because the whole something is becoming new. The second, I don't know why I would be dancing. The second, second person, the one who is becoming quicker than the process dictates. You know these people? They got no patience. We got adult, childhood, teenage, attention deficit disorder, undiagnosed. There are no patients. It's everything is now, now, now. You understand what I'm talking about? This is a constant, the person that constantly prays, Lord, how long? And the situation started 10 minutes ago. You know what I'm talking about? The person that feels like everything is what was me and really it ain't. And they're trying to push past every little thing in their life to get to the next thing. But how many of us realize that sometimes you've got to walk through the process to get the right end result, you can't rush some things in life. This type of person has no fortitude for the ups and downs, the highs and lows, the reaping and the harvesting, and the deserts and wilderness of life. And if you're over the age of one, you understand that life has some ups and downs and highs and lows and some plentiful and some desolate and some harvest and some deserts in life. Amen? Amen? I know that I've experienced it in my life. That's when this person finds themselves in one of the wilderness periods of life, they often miss the point of their season because they're so busy trying to rush through it that they don't see it for what it really is. See, the wilderness, that's a tricky word, Wilderness can be a place of wandering and confusion. A place of loss, but not necessarily of death. It can feel like a season of loss of direction. Let us not forget, the Israelites walked around in the wilderness for how long? Right. Right. And in this season in Israel's story, as they're in captivity in Babylon, they're in the wilderness place of loss of vision and loss of purpose. People of Israel in their exile. You know how I know they lost their purpose? They had one purpose. They connected and their mindset on God. But when they started focusing on the wilderness and the issues and the troubles all around them, they lost their purpose. Their purpose was never to be content in their present state of captivity. But they lost their purpose, and thus they became disheveled and unclear. And some of us have been in a season of wilderness and not knowing why. It's okay, you don't have to put your hand up. I'll put it up for you. We've been a place of feeling a sense of loss of direction, a loss of pay, a purpose, feeling disoriented. And the reason why is because God is about to take you into a new place and you're becoming something different. And what used to work for you, what used to suit you, what used to be okay, ain't okay no more. It don't fit no more. It's too tight, too loose. It's just not right. It's like Goldilocks and the Three Bears. This ain't the right one. You are yet becoming something new, something different than you were in your last season, and then that you're becoming in your faith walk, your journey, and your life. And quiet as it's kept, one of the main reasons why some of us rush through the wilderness of our lives is because of the trauma of transition. Oh, there's trauma in transition. So we like to talk about what it takes to survive and to stay sane when you are in a place of transition and becoming. Yeah, the wilderness is a thing, but what it takes your mental and emotional fortitude 
to survive that thing. No one talks about the loneliness. Loneliness, because not everyone can walk with you in this season. Maybe some friendships and connections have faded away. And that's okay. There's a loneliness and a price to pay for that. Sometimes some things need to fade away because they're hindrance to what you are becoming, becoming bigger in your life than the call that God had for you. There's the loneliness and there's the pushing process, right? The actual process of getting to and becoming what God is calling you to. It's almost like childbirth. So I heard, I didn't birth, nobody made it. <laughs> but the pain of letting go and moving ahead even when you can't see your way through. The anguish, pushing, knowing that I've got to get to the end result. Holding on to literal blind faith that says, I trust you, God, enough to know that what is different and what is new and what you are ordained for me is better than the last season I've been. And then there's the actual evolution of that thing. The actual production of what you've been going through. It's after the loneliness and the process and the pushing, it's actual evolution. And just as I said before, we have all been evolving our whole lives. You were never created to be you 1.0. You were always created to be upgraded. You were always created to keep changing and evolving. You were always created to become your best self. You were always created to not keep crawling on the floor and pooping yourself, but to grow into the full body adult that you are today. You are yet becoming at all times into what you have been purposed to be. And then the third one before I bore you to tears, it is the one who was becoming exactly in the right timing according to the move of the Spirit. God says through the prophet Isaiah, Behold, I am doing a new thing. Shall you not perceive it? Shall you not behold it? This is where we aspire to be, right? This is the person I want to be. And truth be told, I'm probably the one that tries to rush through things. That's why I know that person so well. I ain't got no patience. I'm going to be honest with you. But this is who we aspire to be. When I looked at this Hebrew behind this, research, this idea, see, shall you not perceive it? It's interesting what's happening there. What God is saying is that I am not about to do something. am doing something. That it's already in motion. That even though you were concerned about your wilderness, even though you were crying, woe is me, even though life was weighing you down and life kept pushing on you and pulling on you, the whole time you thought that I was not with you and I had forgotten you and I had forsaken you, yet behold, I was already at work in your situation about to bring you out and transform you into who I had yet called you to. You were becoming the whole time. But your focus it's on the mess. That you have lost your purpose to keep your eye on the one who had called you in the first place. Who you were connected to in the first place. Who had a plan for you the whole time. If your mind was stayed on God, the wilderness wouldn't affect you. where we all aspire to be. To know that God's plan was already in motion for our lives. But even though I've been consumed with the carnalness of the wilderness and where I have been, Spirit is yet calling me to take notice of where I'm yet going to. Perceive. Shall you not behold it? Shall you not perceive it? You are already there. 
It's already in motion. You've already hit past the starting line. I have been shifting you, God says, in the midst of your wilderness. I've been evolving you while you were yet going through. I've been growing you and changing you so that you cannot just survive this season but flourish in the next. And the whole time you've been focused on the dark places, God said, no, you are yet becoming. Israel is in Babylonian captivity. God is telling them just like when you were exiled in Egypt, and you had to cross through the Red Sea. I will make a way again. That's the text. It's one of the other verses. Read that chapter. God shows them that I've been here with you before. I pulled you out before. What you worried about, baby? I got you. God proves God's case to God's people to show them. I never left you. I've always been with you. I've always been team you. I've always been on your side. Remember it. Don't dwell in it. But remember it. But it reminds you to stay connected to the source of power that is still yet calling you to become even greater than you are. I mean, God says, I'm almost done, I promise you. Don't you hate when preachers say that? <laughs> God says, what the, what the book of Isaiah says, not only will I make a way in the wilderness, but I will also provide for you streams in the wasteland. Let me help you out with that real quick. He just told them, God, he, Isaiah just told them that God was reminding them of what they've been through with the Red Sea. And now Isaiah is telling them that I will give you streams in the waste. Why is that important? I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> the last time the water was the obstacle to their freedom. But this time, it is a blessing to their deliverance. Which tells me and you that God can use anything and everything to get you where God needs you to be. What used to be your stumbling block can now be the thing that propels you into where God is taking you. Don't discount what God can do in your life. The Red Sea could have drowned them, but it didn't. But now I'm going to give you streams in the wasteland. I'm to show you that I'm still I am that I am. I'm still God, and above me there is no one else. And I still care about your life. I am doing a new thing. Shall you not hold what I am doing? And start giving some perspective to life and start speaking what this season is showing us. I am the coming. Somebody say, I am the coming. Oh, you ain't saying like you meant it. You said it like you're still not sure. I am the coming. I am becoming a better version of me than I was yesterday. I am becoming healed from childhood trauma that used to keep me stuck in old patterns and old ways. I am becoming someone who changes my mindset according to the will of God. I am becoming someone who knows that I am fearfully and wonderfully created in the image of God. I am becoming more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ. I am becoming one who trusts that God has a plan for my life and not leave me or forsake me. I am becoming someone I am proud of. I am becoming a product of my purpose and a vessel for God's vision. I am becoming a new creation. I am becoming all that God said I would be. I am becoming. Shall you not behold it? Coming as a transition, transformation, transferring, evolution. My last point, and I'm going to be done. I said it this morning, too. <laughs> Yesterday, some friends and I went to go see The Woman King, and this is my third time seeing it, y'all. It's a fantastic movie. Please take your eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 dollars and go see it. It's worth it. Promise you go to the matinee, that's like five dollars. Because inflation is a thing, I understand. But 
There's a scene at the height of the movie. There's a scene with one of the main characters, Naomi. And what she's in prison or hidden in a room. This is a bit of a spoiler alert, I'm sorry. Not a big one, but just a little bit. Shh. Did somebody say shh? <laughs> somebody say shh? That's hilarious. But she's a, now man's in prison in this room. She's hidden in this room. And the one who has put her there comes into the room, and she is irate, of course. She's yelling at him, why have you put me here? Why are you holding me here? I am not your slave. I am not your captain. I don't belong to you. I want to be free. She's yelling at him. She's understandably upset, of course. So her current state is not the liberation she has known for her life. And the person who is holding her there turns to her in an effort to calm her act of solidarity and friendship and says to her, he takes the key to the room and puts it in her hand and says to her, you have the key now. You determine when the lock is turned. And that stood out to me. Many things in that movie stood out to me. There were about 411 sermons in there. But that stood out to me because it's where many of us are in this moment. God has given us with God's word, with God's promise, the keys to liberate us from our places of wilderness and desolation. The keys is the knowledge and the faith and knowing that we have a God who will never leave us nor forsake us. That God has a plan for our lives. That God has created us to, to move and to morph and to change to become truly who we were envisioned to be. We have had the keys the whole time. The knowledge we have to unlock our mindset, our mood, our mentality, our way of being has been with you the whole time. God has told you how to become. The question is, and I'll leave you with this, now you must determine when you will turn the lock. Let us pray. God, we thank you that you don't leave us in places of desolation and wilderness. That you are calling us and transforming us into our best selves. We thank you, God, that your promise remains true as it did in the days of Isaiah in the 8th century as it does now. That you are with us always, even into the ends of the earth. That you love us, that you've not forsaken us or forgotten us. Help us, God, to yield to your will. Help us to not get in our own way. Help us, God, to love you and trust you enough to know that even when we don't know the plan, that you are yet at work in our lives. We thank you, God, and we count these things as done in Jesus' name. Amen.